Good morning. I think it's still morning. It's a pleasure to talk with all of you. Um, that, what a couple of cool presentations to follow. I think this will be fun. Um, I have to admit, I'm going to use the same slides for a different presentation. Uh, I was, uh, thought I was going to talk about social emotional learning skills, and I saw I was doing quality on the, uh, on the guide, on the program, and then I saw we were going to have this interesting meeting with a bunch of focus on process and descriptions of programs, and with young people here as well. So I've been kind of changing the, the uh, remarks in my head uh, several times on the way here, but I'm going to try and do it with the same slides. Um, except we need a different title, right? The title that I would choose for, for this uh, set of remarks are, uh, what do you want to prove and to whom? Or, why we need a concept for youth skill growth that we can position around and improve performance toward. Um, I'm going to spiral in, start out talking about program, program evaluation, and then quality, and then down into social emotional skill development, and talk about uh, measure development work that we've been doing. Um, a brief story, how many people here are familiar with early childhood education and early childhood policy and universal pre-K and what's been happening over the last two decades? All right. So you may appreciate the elements of this story. So if you think 15 years ago and Ellen Freed and the concept of developmentally appropriate practice, and I don't know if you've ever been to a National Association for the Education of Young Children conference, but how important that concept of developmentally appropriate practice or quality was in the early childhood field and how it organized the profession to become more professionalized and to advocate for its interests um, in legislatures, really state legislatures especially, across the country. Now developmentally appropriate practice has fallen out of fashion um, in some sense uh, because it's not outcomes focused. But that concept of quality was a really important organizing principle that I would say is also happening, has parallels in the after school, out of school time field. Our work, NIOS work, if you step into the school day, the Danielson framework, the class, all these measures of process quality measure similar constructs. And they're capturing similar kinds of the really important stuff that happens with adult-child interaction. Uh, the measure developers probably wouldn't want to say this, but they all basically form two pretty clear factors, warmth and instruction, and we're all looking at the same stuff. It's problematic because we're sampling as we go in and grab those observations, so our measures are pretty unreliable as a representation of overall quality, but we do the best we can. So you've got developmentally appropriate practice out there, but it wasn't until developmentally appropriate practice, which organized the profession, kind of left the limelight and school readiness stepped in. And school readiness became an umbrella, an outcome, or a, really a skill umbrella that we could talk about developmental change and milestones for four-year-olds that really allowed state legislatures especially to organize around policy and around locally derived studies that used, a, there were a range of school readiness uh, measures, the child observation re record, the Brigant screen, early on the work sampling system, there were a range of these measures that kind of brought the field together around the many disparate outcomes you could measure with four-year-olds. And as that concept of school readiness consolidated, state, local studies, state level studies were enacted, because we, we had the randomized trials, right? We had high scope, the, the Perry study, we had Abecedarian, we had Chicago Parent and Child. We had the randomized or the really high quality quasi-experimental studies for some time, but as state legislatures started to produce local studies using the concept of, of, of school readiness, state legislatures started to move. And so when I ask the question, what do you want to prove and to whom, I, I, would, I would suggest, or at least my answer to that would be, is we're still fairly unclear. Neil, that was a great presentation, and the work you're doing has some answers to that. I, I, I'm not going to pretend to answer for you, but I think that what I want to prove <laughs> is that after school has an effect on school day outcomes, and the people I'd want to prove it to would be the funders of 21st century, or at least in, in, the, in the realm of the work that you're doing. It's a fairly clear answer, but it gets a lot less clear on both of those counts for the rest of us. And when I ask that question of, of folks who work in systems around the country, what do you want to prove and to whom, I find it's a very difficult question to answer, and I find that I also am, am at a loss for answering that question most of the time very quick, clearly. Part of the what do you want to prove part has something to do with the jingle, jangle, jungle gym that we live in, the jingle fallacy and the jangle fallacy, right? When we talk about measures, the same words that mean different wor things and different words that mean the same things, and we're all reading these construct names and none of us are looking at the items and we don't know what the heck we're measuring and we have a really hard time communicating about it. And, you know, we're all scholars and we have lots of time to spend subsidized working on these issues, but people out in the field who are trying to conduct evaluation are really struggling with this set, these sets of issues. So that the various compendia of measures that have been coming out in 
Now, remember, do you remember expanded learning time and extended learning time, the FAD two years ago? Well, then non-cognitives hit, right? The CCR report and 21st century report, and now we're all swimming around in youth skill terminology, and we're, it's very difficult to know what the heck you're measuring. The constructs have the same names. The items often are very different. So that's the what do you want to prove. The to whom part is also pretty tough. Most out-of-school time programs are funded locally. So is it the local United Way CEO who's an important part of your funding? Is it a local ph philanthropy or a community foundation? That to whom question is really answered locally. So it's really important. It, you can see how it could be very useful if we had a more effective concept of the skills that we want to grow with kids, a readiness concept, as Karen called it. I personally love that term. Uh, but a readiness concept that was about skill growth for in kids who were in these, these developmentally deep and rich settings um, that we could use locally and people could convince who they needed to. And that might help the after school a great deal. So ultimately, in the what do you want to prove and to whom uh, frame, for me, this is, this is about social change. We want after school to be funded sustainably by the public sector, and we want to do it at scale, and we want to have really rich settings that bring community resources in and help kids grow, right? So we want to do it at scale. What do you want to prove and to whom? If we can get clearer at, those, at answering those questions, I think it will advance the field, and that's what I want to talk about. Uh, let's see if that moves. So first things first, position performance proof. Uh, when I ask the question, what do you want to prove and to whom, it gets us into this discussion about why we're doing evaluation in the first place. And it's kind of, you know, I'm the quality guy, so I'm in an uncomfortable position on the outcomes evaluation panel, even though I really appreciate deeply the work that's been done here. That's not been the focal point of our work. Um, position performance proof. Positioning, you don't even need to measure anything. Before you start spending money, can we describe what we think is happening for kids in these, in these programs. Can we describe what the result of our investment in their time, because they're showing up and spending time and their parents are getting them here, um, and the investment in the program staff. Can we say what we think is happening, what skills are growing? I don't think that question is so easily answered. And again, with the school readiness example, even before we started measuring things, the positioning value of a coherent concept of skill growth in early childhood that was nicely summary, sounded kind of engaging, um, went a long, long ways. So then we get to the issue of performance. So when we ask people about why they want to measure things in the out-of-school time field, um, you get a mix of answers that have to do with performance and proof. And people across the board will say, well, one of the main things I want to do is improve performance. And that comes back to the question that Jenny kind of raised in the beginning. Are out-of-school time or after-school programs high quality across the board, at scale, consistently? The answer to that question is I think they're probably getting a lot better in the last 10 years of work we've done on this, but probably still not yet. So how, do we want to really do outcomes evaluations on programs that are not yet reaching their full potential in terms of the developmental change they're producing? It's a chicken egg thing. We need the outcome evaluations. We need researchers as sophisticated as Neil working on these issues. But at the same time, when you ask most local actors, what they really want to do is give people performance feedback. They want to measure things so they can give people information they can use to get better at what they do. The problem is we're all stuck in proof. And this is, I think you all will appreciate these remarks. We go to grad school and we're taught about internal validity of the research design. And we're talking about a concept of reliability that has to do with intra-individual, uh, an intra-individual frame. Within me, I pick a bunch of items that all measure the same thing, and those items increase the precision of my measure. And I would argue that those two frames, the internal validity of the research design, and that concept of reliability focused on intra-individual trait or state, really get in the way of the stuff we need to measure when we do performance change. And again, just like the jingle jangle part about the names of the measures, those methodological things, they create a jingle jangle jungle where people can't really figure out why they're measuring what they're trying, they think is important and how to communicate that information to people who can use it. So you can tell uh, why I got a job working for Karen because I like to make a lot of pictures too. In fact, we rarely talk, we just send pictures back and forth. And you know, I have to say, I was trying to think of something funny to say when I heard that there might be youth here. Are there, are there young people in the room now? I don't know. Program participants? I don't know. Well, I was trying to think of something funny to say to the two or three of you who are here, and I was going to mention my second daughter, who uh, is now 18. But over the years, I noticed, unlike my other two kids, uh, whenever she would get ready to go somewhere um, that she wanted to look nice for, she would, of course, end up looking very nice. And I would go to her room, and I would, she'd be standing there, and she'd look very beautiful. But beside her would be this little small pile of clothes. 
And you could tell she'd really been taking things on and putting things off and trying to get ready so she looked nice at this wherever she was going to go. And so for those of you, if there aren't any young folks in the room, if you like doing that sort of thing, then being an academic or a researcher is great for you because we do the same thing with words. <laughs> and standing beside this podium is a large pile of the prior ideas of many of the people sitting in this room that we repackage in these, these, these pictures in the work of translation that we do. Because we're really, you know, we're interested in social change. We want to change public policy. We want to translate this kind of work to a broader audiences. So that's why the pictures. Um, Again, I didn't put this deck together for this presentation, so I'll be brief on this one. The basic point is, so we tend to think about outputs and inputs and outcomes a little differently than this model. And typically when we talk about outcomes, we put kid skills, that, that box on the, on the far right. But I want to call outputs anything that the people in an after school program can control. And since skill building, we'll get to this in a minute, is basically practice, practice, practice. You're actually trying out the things that you're trying to become. Then you can watch that happen. That's an output. That's something people can do before we measure. Everything else to the, to the left on that model is quality. And it's important, this gets us back to that performance proof difference. If I'm going to do performance measurement, I've got some other issues in front of me before I start thinking about reliability and validity. Namely, I need to think about the meaningfulness of the stuff I'm measuring. That's kind of validity in a broad sense. Um, do the people I'm giving the information to think that it's relevant? A coefficient on efficacy? I don't know. It's really tough to act on that. So this is quality, and the meaningfulness is really important. Also, the feasibility, because often when we're doing performance work and often when we're doing evaluation, the people in the field are collecting the data. And if they can't collect it, it just doesn't matter whether it's reliable and valid. And then finally, the feasibility of, um, of getting the information back to people. Performance feedback is what helps people change. If you get them their information in a timely fashion and in a place where they can use it, then they're likely to improve performance. But if you can't, it just doesn't matter. So there are some different priorities. And if you look at this, if you look at that diagonal, quant quality management practices, staff engagement, those are the job of the manager. If I can give you a performance, piece of performance information on those dimensions, I as the manager will say, oh, this is my job. And especially if I can put your score next to the, I don't know, the average for all the other sites in your system, it's not a rigorous comparison, it's not a counterfactual condition, but it is a normative condition and we can create lots of norms that gives you a lot of information about where your performance is relative to others that you know. The same is true on the second diagonal, quality instructional practices and youth engagement. These are also setting measures. We tend, I, I thought, Jenny, I thought your presentation was great. We tend to think about youth engagement as something you time sample. So when I go in to collect data on quality and I want to see what's going on in the quality of the adult practices, I ask the kids if they're engaged at that moment. And I average across those or I combine those into some kind of a composite. Again, those are setting, they're not individual level ratings, they're setting level scores. And they mean something to the teacher whose job it is to deliver practices and to keep kids engaged. And that's really where the field is at, is in those first four boxes to the left. There's been a ton of progress made there. But when we start to think about skills, things get a little dicey, right? I can measure each of those things once a year, give you a normative comparison, and you're off to the races. You can think about what to do. But to do skills, yeah, I can do norms, but it's also good to look at growth. And that gets us into a whole other giant ball of wax that's a real challenge, but I would, I would suggest that performance information at multiple time points on kids, on skills that are relevant to the people funding it and to the families who are sending their children there would be pretty compelling evidence. It's certainly the way that it's working in Head Start. It's certainly the way that it's working in universal pre-K where child assessments are mandated one, two, three times a year and you can see the growth and you can also see the kids who are not going up. So note the colors stay the same. So green is still quality. This is just a change in shape. Green is still quality. Purple is the engagement of kids in quality and then skills. Uh, we've already seen this a couple times. Um, the thing I would say here is just we introduced this model because we wanted to talk about skill building in the after school field to make a couple of really important points. One was just because you change the quality of an after school program does not mean that the scores in the school district go up next year. And for years, we were dealing with people who were asking us exactly that question, especially United Ways with the community impact frame. They wanted to know when population level achievement was going to change as a result of their investment in quality for the 50 programs that they funded. It's a totally legit question, but it's a really tough one to prove in the data I collect this year. Neil, it's taken, you know, the work that Neil does with 
to do the sophisticated, use the sophisticated statistics that he has to get at models that kind of get us the answer to that question. So one is that transfer is not automatic. It's difficult to do something in one setting and then walk into another one and do it again. It's, and especially with a different adult. That's a very difficult thing to do. The other point is um, how do you build skills? It's practice, 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 right? You gotta do something a bunch of times. And so each point of service session, I need a series of sessions where I'm introducing the skill and the kids are into it. They're bringing that unit of energy that's the most important unit of energy, which is their interest. So you need multiple of those before, you start, before skills start to occur, and skills need to grow towards a mastery experience or some sense of efficacy, a belief I can do this before I can walk out of that room and do it somewhere else. So I want to talk a little bit about a project that we're doing where we're building or uh, uh, adopting and developing social emotional learning measures. Not because I think we've got it exactly right. I don't think we've got it exactly right but because it raises a number of issues in that skills box. How would we measure skills in such a way, how would we name skills in such a way that valued, was valuable for positioning and measure them in such a way that was valuable to improve performance? So the SCL, SEL challenge is funded by this uh, SCE foundation. Uh, they're a Chicago uh, foundation interested in social emotional learning. There are three phases. Um, I can tell you the coolest part about this work, which I'm not going to talk about, is, again, it's that pile of clothes. Um, you know, what we're finding are these, are these are eight exemplary programs that are the study subjects. Uh, they were selected because they could talk about social-emotional learning and their, their processes and methods to grow social-emotional skills within specific five specific domains I'll show you in a minute. So they were selected because they were good at describing in a disciplinary language of some sort, whatever it was, psychotherapeutic, social work, uh, you know, psychology. Uh, they could describe what they were trying to do really well. And the interesting thing about their program designs is there are a bunch of explicit skills. One program is a boat building and carpentry program. Another one's a theater program. Another one's a community organizing program. Another one is focused on basically self-help and group therapy where you're working on intimate relationships and sexuality. They have explicit purposes. Those explicit skills, because they're hard and because they occur over 30, 40, 50 sessions, there's enough intensity, are a great opportunity for all the challenges, frustrations, failures, and mistakes that occur in that process of skill building to come out and give you great opportunities to build social emotional skills. Because what happens when you get the board you've been working on for four program sessions cut the wrong way and the damn thing won't fit on the boat? You freak out. You get mad. And it's a perfect opportunity to talk about emotion management. And so I would say, I can look around the room at people who have been telling the story for a couple decades. It's, I don't know, it's kind of interesting to retell it. Um, these are the domains. And I want to talk a little bit about the level of abstraction, because level ab abstraction really matters when we're thinking about skills that, that, people engage, that people grow or learning. So emotion management, empathy, teamwork, responsibility, initiative and grit. We couldn't really make grit a separate category, but it's still a really sexy word, right? But we're only going for eight months here. It's hard to really demonstrate grit in eight months. We'll just call that initiative. Um, and then skills for agency action. You know, the other interesting thing about thing we think these are social emotional skills. Basically, people do work on social emotional skills. Everybody measures pro social skills. There's very little, really, very good on emotion that's a broadly used measure. And what are those skills for? They're really to do stuff. Social emotional skills just aren't about how you feel and being well adjusted. They're action skills. They're what you need to get a sophisticated project of multiple sessions and lots of steps with diffuse goals that you have to figure out what the goals are and you have to follow very detailed multi-step sequential processes to get the thing done. Build a boat. Do a really great theater production. Organize the Boston public schools around issues uh, you know, about kids not getting bus passes. Those are sophisticated high challenge projects and this is what it takes to get them done. It's been a real, I don't know, it's been a realization for me. We've been kind of staying away from child outcomes for a number of years, just trying to focus on quality and reading into the literature on social emotional skills. It ain't soft and fuzzy. This, these are action skills. These are the same skills you need when you get out of high school and you've got to figure out where to get your financial aid. And that line you have to stand in forever where no one seems to care that you're there, nor to want you there, and you still have to do that to get your financial aid. Right? This is, like, this is how you do life stuff. So one of the problems was we wanted behavioral data because behavioral data is the best for performance improvement. 
I can ask people about their internal states, but then when I give that information to their, to their staff, it's very difficult for them to act on it. Behavioral data is the best kind of performance improvement data. The problem is behavior is only loosely related to what's going on inside. People do things for all kinds of reasons. So we can measure behavior, and we think that's really important data, but we also wanted to get in to the mental objects that characterize the person. Now, we could probably have a psychological disciplinary battle about that little orange stack there, iconic, symbolic, and phenomenal. Um, the point is, the context, the point of service, the classroom goes into the person and it has an effect. It sets up the cues and you read it. You read it and then you act, and then your action becomes part of the context, right? That's pretty straightforward. We wanted the behavioral measures, but we had to think beyond behavior. And again, SEL measures tend to be a mix of things. You look at the items there, attitudes, beliefs, behaviors, there are all kinds of things mixed together. And so the basic point is that we wanted to separate those things, the ment uh, have, a, have a framework to separate the mental objects from the behavioral ones. It's also important, that iconic level, that's where emotion lives. The, I'll explain the levels real quickly. Iconic is, is a level of the self that is where you where you're get triggered. It's your, sen what they, we call them sensory affective motor schema, your schema or your scripts. A cue happens in the environment, it goes into the system, emotion is happening, and there's a physical reaction. And it happens super fast. And so for kids who have been exposed to trauma, who are the primary subject group of the work we're doing in this SEL challenge, we need a model of the self that helps us get at that emotion stuff. How do you slow down your emotions? It's slightly different than all the other social emotional skills that we mentioned that live up there on the symbolic level where are all your plans, beliefs, ideas, concepts, all that stuff. And then the phenomenal is just whatever you happen to be paying attention at this moment. So that's how we break the person up. But the idea is that we've got to separate the mental objects from the behavioral ones. So we selected a set of, I don't know if they would call them this, but Child Trends did some work on flourishing and they tested a bunch of measures. Um, they're really youth reports about their own behaviors, but they're at a very high level of abstraction. And, you know, it's really hard to report on your own behavior. I, we, we call them beliefs about your behavior. And so these are the kind of, these are items like we see all the time in SEL measures. And if you, there's one sample item in each of several constructs that fit in those domains. And if you look at like adolescent empathy, it's important for me to understand how other people feel. That's pretty abstract. It's not about in this setting today how people feel. It's not about a range of feelings. It's not about why it's important. It's pretty abstract, and you know these measures, these, they demonstrate good reliability. I'm sure they're probably pretty stable over time. They probably s demonstrate factorial invariance at multiple time points if you're going to deal with growth. They're the kind of thing we typically use when we're measuring SEL skills. The question is, are they going to change over six months, over the course of 30 sessions? Are we going to see a change? And that's where we're worried, and you know, all those studies don't get published, but when you measure these skills, they often go down. And there's, that's a whole other discussion. So these were the efficacy beliefs. Do I think I'm good at something in a domain, right? Do I think I'm good at emotion management? Nope, I don't want to go that way. And then there were a set of behavioral indicators. And this is, this is where I'll leave it. Just if you read down the, the right-hand column, these are subdomains. So there's the five domains. These are subdomains. And within each domain, there are four or five behavioral indicators. The cool thing about this is we uh, we've been using Reed Larson as a consultant on this work. We've been reading Reed's stuff forever. Um, we used Reed, you know, we've developed a theory kind of with Reed about these, these domains, and we asked our subjects, our expert practitioners, about it in their applications. We asked them when they built these skills, how they did it, what the behaviors were kids were doing, what were the key experiences in developing these skills, and then we went into these fairly long applications and extracted all the phrases and words that they used to describe youth behaviors within domain. And then we took them back to them and had them organize them. And we had them organize them by difficulty and within domain. And then we had them do some revisions as well. And so we've been working on them. And these are the set of subdomains that we got that really, I think, are pretty cool, right? And we're getting into these items that are really mapped onto their settings. And so the thing that we've done after building those items is this is one, the items from one of those domains is we've gone back and asked them about content and substantive validity. So are these items important? Are you trying to produce these skills? Are you trying to give kids the opportunity to do these things? Because these are behaviors. And then 
what's the prevalence at entry? What percentage of your kids have this skill when they come in and what percentage have it when they go out? And we want to pick the indicators where the kids come in low and they leave high because those are the indicators the program changes. So that we're trying to tune a set of behavioral measures to program environments focused on SEL skill building so that we can capture change over time. Um, with that, I will uh, leave it the rest for questions and discussion. It's been a pleasure talking with you.